preaching on who we are as a church, but I, I felt like God wanted us to go um, into a series called uh, Build Your Church. And similar off of our mission statement, like what is the church that God is calling us to be? Uh, where is, what is the church that, when, when, when Jesus was preaching on the earth, when he was establishing the church, literally, like he's, he, he brings these disciples together and then he sends them out. They're, they're the first church planters. He's sending them out to plant churches. He's establishing what the church will be. And so there's some principles that he taught in the Gospels uh, that, that are good for us as a community, but uh, as individuals, as the church, you are the church of Jesus Christ. These are some principles that I think are foundational to you, and, it, and it's where our values come from. It's where who we are. It's all of those things. It's, it's how we operate, all these. So it's still connected to where we we're going to go. But I just felt the Lord was leading us down this direction. And so uh, I, I want us to dig into this subject over the next week. What is Jesus teaching us to be? It's what is the church that he has called us to be? And so you have to kind of play double. Like when I say the church, I am talking about this community, but I'm also talking about your life. I'm talking about this community of believers. Who are we called to be? But Hopefully, this community is a reflection of you as the church. Like, we come together, and we're eclectic, and we have different backgrounds and different gifts and different things. And so, as, as you are a reflection of Christ, hopefully, this community is a reflection of Christ as we come together. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. We are going to be in this passage the entire day. If you grew up in church, and you went to kids' church, Anybody at old school kids church with the felt board and the little things stuck on the wall? Come on now. We need to bring, I'm going to make Lauren bring those back just because. Forget YouTube and TVs. We're bringing felt boards back. Uh, like, I, I don't know why when I talk about felt boards, there's like a smell that I can like, maybe it's like old church smell. I don't know, but it like comes to my brain. But, uh, but if you grew up in church and you grew up in kids church, you've heard this passage um, and I think it's interesting how uh, Jesus was not giving a kid's lesson, but sometimes we associate some of his teachings to kid's lessons. We think they're elementary, yet most of us don't live by them. Uh, and this is one of those passages that when I think of this passage, I think of it as a kid's lesson, but I think how often my life doesn't reflect this passage. And maybe you can relate to that, maybe not. But uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, as you're turning there, uh, we, we got away and, and I've been trying to rest better and do some things and we went to Florida and went fishing and did some stuff. Uh, but we, uh, I got an insane deal to go to Disney for two days. Like literally like the hotel was like $130 and I was like, well, we have to go now. <laughs> and so, you know, how you justify things. You're like, like, uh, Lauren, we were looking at her email yesterday and she gets all these like marketing emails from like Target and, uh, home goods or whatever. I don't know where she gets them from, but every time she's like, there's a sale. So we have to do it. Like, and I'm like, so this was one of those situations. I'm like, well, I, this is so cheap. Like we must go. And so I'm like, fine, let's do it. And so we went and, uh, up to this point, my son, Logan, Kara is the more ambitious one. She's a lot more like me. Logan is a lot more careful like his mother. Lauren is well calculated. She thinks through things. I'm like, let's just go. We'll figure it out on the way. Uh, Justin likes to call me fluid uh, because I'm just like, let's just go and we'll, we'll make a plan along the way and it'll be great. But uh, Kara's a lot like me. She's just going to charge ahead. Uh, she's just going to will it out. I, I forced her onto the Magnum as her first roller coaster. Uh, and, and I was like, you're going to love it. And if you don't love it, I'm going to make you ride it again until you love it. That's just our relationship. That's how we operate. And, uh, and I think I scared the crap out of her, but I'm like, I'll make you ride more. So, um, but Logan is more careful. And so up into this trip, Logan hates roller coasters. We took him on a roller coaster when he was little, little scared, scared everything out of him, just terrified him. And so up to this point, he refused. We, Lauren's sister took us to Cedar Point. She had free tickets. Logan was like, I just want to ride all the like spinny rides the whole day, which is my worst nightmare. That Anybody relate? Like that's literally hell would be riding spinny rides for all eternity. Like that would be my personal like 
please God. And, uh, and so, so like that's all Logan wanted to do. But for something came over him on this trip where he felt like being brave. I think it was he felt left out. And you know how when you feel left out, you like kind of like force yourself into things? And so he forced himself onto the Seven Dwarfs mine ride. And as he's getting on, like, I, I know he's trying to be tough, but he's nervous. And we sit down, and he grabs the lap bar, and I'm riding with him. And I'm, there's a significant size difference between me and my son, uh, especially in the leg area when you're sitting down in a seat. This kid pulled down the lap bar so tight, I thought the circulation was cut off. I was going to be an amputee. There was no blood flow. He pulled it down, and, I'm, and, and literally the lady had to come by because she saw I was freaking out and released it a little bit. But as she released it, the terror went into Logan's face. Like, so he started checking it like 30 times, and I'm like, dude, I'm not going to let you fly out of a roller coaster. It's not even that big of a roller coaster. Like, and so, like, but, but as we were taking off, he's checking it. He's making sure every, because you got a buckle, then the lap bar. You have all the things. And I'm like, dude, you are fine. But this, the, the carefulness within him, trying to make sure that, that the things that are supposed to hold him are actually doing it, was, was just, he was terrified that something was going to go wrong. Some of y'all can relate to that. Like some of y'all like check things like 30 different times. Anybody go through your whole house and you make sure every door is locked like three times before you go to bed? Now I get being careful, but like there's a limit. Some of y'all check like 30, 40, 50 times and I'm like, Dude, it, it was locked five minutes ago. It's still locked now. Like this was Logan in this moment, just terrified because he wanted to have the confidence that the things that were meant to keep him safe, he wanted to have faith that they would do what they were designed for. This morning I want to talk about uh, the, the immovable church, the church with a firm foundation, what does the church that is secure in what's holding it, what does the church look like when, when you have a foundation, when you're immovable, when you're not fluid, when you, when you trust in the things that God has given you to keep you secure, what does that church look like? It's interesting, I, I was sharing with our team before service, is uh, we, we are living in a time that is very fluid, People are very fluid. I look at my grandparents, and, and they lived in their house. They, they paid off their house. They, they lived there for, they worked jobs for, till they were 65, the same job. My grandpa was a firefighter, and he worked it until he retired, and they paid off their house. And, and I'm looking at how our grandparents grew up, or even our, some of our parents, and how very different it looks for my generation and younger. Even when you consult with like mortgage people, they'll tell you like, don't, don't worry about how much you put down because you're probably not going to live in your house for 30 years anyway. So put down the minimum and invest your money somewhere else and do other things. Or, or we, even our careers, like most of us don't think of our careers as a lifetime career because we live in a culture where things are very fluid even Lauren and I were talking at dinner the other night, and we were thinking about how Anchor's coming up on his five-year anniversary, and we've lived in Toledo and Sylvania for six years. It's the longest we've ever lived in one place in our marriage. It's interesting how, how our foundations almost are like, are, are almost like RVs is our life. Instead of a foundation, we live in a house. It's our place where it's secure and it's there forever. Our lives are very nomadic anymore. And so I started thinking about what does that do to our faith? What does that do with our Christ? Like, and e even the church, like how we operate, I, I think it's trickled into our faith communities where we don't seem to have these firm foundations in the community that, that God has brought together, we kind of just float wherever make us, makes us feel good. Even the value of church, the value of gathering together, encouraging one another, praying for one another, worshiping together, honoring God in our community almost doesn't have as much value anymore. 
And so what does the church look like that, that God calls us to be immovable, to have this firm foundation? And Jesus actually addresses it in Matthew chapter 7. And, and, and I want us to dig into this passage because this is what I think happens. I think we go to Christ most of the time when things go wrong. We want to build a foundation when things are in chaos. But when normal life is happening, we live this nomadic life. Here's what I mean by that. I was talking to someone this week that thinks they might have lung cancer. And, and I legitimately was caring for them and wanted to pray for them. But they made this comment. They said, they said I've been praying so much more in my life. And and I was, I was happy for them that they were going to the Lord with their need. I, I'm, not, I'm not shaming them or saying anything's wrong. But it made me sad a little bit. Thinking like your, your prayer life, your thermometer for your prayer life goes up when you're in need. But two months ago, three months ago, would, what, what, what would the disparity be between where your prayer life was then and now? And I was thinking about the faith community and how... We, we, we want to build a foundation in, in trial, but we're fluid in the everyday. And so Jesus talks about this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, this is what Jesus says. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and it torrents and floodwaters rise, the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come and the wind beats against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus gives this simple yet foundational, powerful teaching about our faith life right in the midst of the book of Matthew. Right in the midst of, of these people are gathering around. It's early in his ministry. He just got done with the Sermon on the Mound. And he's talking about all of these concepts that are just seem so foreign. And, and he digs in. And it's interesting how he starts. Because, because he's setting up this teaching in the first sentence. He's setting up the, the, the backing for having a firm foundation in the very first thing he says. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows is wise. And I hear that and I, and I begin to roll through it. And, and, and he's setting up this idea that if you have your faith in the right source, you already have everything you need. It's the basis for your life. It's where everything must begin. Have you ever gone to look for something uh, or a tool or, or an item around your house or, or something you need and you can't find it? It's one of my biggest pet peeves. I, have, I went out and I got a nice toolbox. I was like, I'm going to be organized. And I had all my tools in there. Everything has a home. Anyone ever like, like you're just an organized person. You have every, some of you are like, I'm not organized at all. It's a big pile. I just sift through the pile when I need it. I'm, I'm not like that. And so my toolbox is a sacred place because when I'm in the middle of a project, which usually isn't planned, I usually start doing projects randomly, I want to know where my stuff is. But there's nothing more frustrating than going to my toolbox and I need a tape measure. How many of y'all know tape measures just get lost all the time? Like, I, I swear someone is hoarding tape measures somewhere because every time I need one, I can't find it. And so I go, and, and literally the other day, Lauren needed a tape measure, and she was like, I'm going to go get your tape measure. And I said, I will only allow you, <laughs> sounds bad, I was like, I will only allow you to touch my tape measure if you promise to put it back in the drawer. <laughs> she was like, are you kidding me? I'm going to get your tape measure. It did not end up back in the drawer. But <laughs> I found it, and I put it back in the drawer. But there's nothing more frustrating than needing a tool, ne knowing what you need, uh, and, and, and knowing where you need to go to get something, and it's not there. 
But when you know where something is, when you know where the tool that you need is, where what is going to get the job done is, it, it's like there, there is a peace that comes over you in the middle of a project. This is why Jesus starts this passage how he does, because he's setting up the basis for if you know who I am, if you lean into my teachings, if you trust me, if your faith is in the right source, you have everything you need to begin with. It won't matter what storms come against you. If, you. if you trust me, if your faith is in the right thing, you will have a firm foundation. See, learning to become immovable, building your foundation for your life starts in this simple sentence. It starts in Christ. Christ. And I know that seems so elementary and so simple, but I look at people's lives, I, I even look at my own life at times, and I think how often I feel, fill the place that Jesus should be sitting in with so many other things. How often I, I, I put my trust and my faith in the wrong things, and how easily we can slip into that foolish seat. We build our lives around the wrong things. We, we use the wrong tools because what happens when you can't find the right tool? So you start pulling out like a ruler or, or you use, anyone ever try to measure something with like a piece of rope or you kind of eyeball it and you're like, I think that's this many inches. I do it all the time. Sam, I know you do it. You're building rooms for us in the basement. I see it. But <laughs> Sam does a great job. I'm not, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, but like how often do we try to use the wrong tool or jerry-rig our lives with the wrong thing and it turns into complete chaos or mess? See, we jerry-rig our lives and we wonder why things don't work right. But, but look how Jesus intentionally starts this. He says, this is the only thing you need. Jesus must be first. And if you put your faith in my teachings, if I am your foundation, you will be wise. You will be a person that builds your house on solid rock. Jesus is literally giving you the cheat code to life. Jesus is giving you what you need. That's why, uh, I know we're not in the values series, but, but that's why our very first value as a church is that Jesus is going to be first. Because when Jesus is first, when we disagree, we can go back to his feet. When we don't align right, we can go back to his feet. When chaos comes, we can go back to his feet. When we're in celebration, we can go back to his feet. If Jesus is the most important, then he's giving us the code to make everything else all right. It's how we sustain this community is in his presence. And, and when he begins to slip to number two or three, that's when churches become dysfunctional. That's when splits happen. That's when anger rises. That's, that's when all these other things begin to fill the house of God. And I think the same thing happens in our lives. It's when the chaos comes forth. It's when things break. He's literally telling you, you want to run the race, you want to finish strong, you want to be immovable. My teachings are key. And I used to hear this verse, and I used to hear this passage, even, even in my adulthood, and I thought, oh man, the rules are coming now, right? Anybody you know what I'm talking about? Like, Jesus is like, listen to my teachings, and you'll be fine. And I'm like, okay, where's the rules? What do I got to do? But that's not really what Jesus is doing. What Jesus is saying is if you put your faith in me, if I'm your foundation, there will be a natural progression toward holiness. It's not about rules and what you have to do. It's about pursuing my presence. And when you pursue Jesus' presence, your life becomes a reflection of who he is. See, what Jesus is teaching us is that what you invest into has a direct output on the consistency of your life. So when he's talking about building foundations and doing all these things, what he's really talking about is investment. Now, I hate money. I hate it. I've talked about this before. It's not my thing. But, but like what Jesus is saying is if you invest into what I'm saying, the output of your life will be a reflection of who I am. What he's saying is do you have the right lap bar holding you down? If you have the right lap bar, if you have the right faith, 
and what's holding you in place, you don't need to check it 30 times. You know that I am with you. You know that I am leading you. See, one of the hardest things I've learned in my life as I get older, and, and it's interesting, we have uh, Thomas and his wife Anne who uh, pastor all the CMA churches. They're with us today. And I just had a meeting with Thomas a few weeks ago, and he challenged me about where I invest my time. And I appreciate it. Because it was like a gut check. You ever have someone just kind of call you out on some things? And, and he wasn't doing it to be mean. He was doing it very lovingly. But he challenged me on, on where am I investing my time? Where am I putting it in? Because when you invest into something, when you put your time into something, it's, it's going to have a draw. And what happens a lot of times in our lives is we invest into all the wrong things. And we wonder why our lives are empty. We wonder why we don't feel fulfilled. We wonder why our marriages are falling apart or we can't get our finances right or we can't make the moves we want to. It's because we're investing into all the wrong things. It's like a chess game. When you, when you move one, it takes away from something else. When you give your time to something, you're saying no to something else. I had to make the call with my daughter. I, I have one more season of coaching her in soccer. And I said, I want to give you this because she begged me. I didn't want to do it. She begged me. And I said, fine, I'll coach you one more time. But I knew if I made this commitment, I would have to say no to other things in my life. Because if I tried to give to everything, I would have nothing left at the end. And when Jesus says, put your foundation, your faith in me, he's saying, this is your number one priority is my presence before anything else. Even before us gathering, your number one priority is sitting in his presence, listening to him, being led by him, letting him mold you into being more Christ-like and becoming more holy and, and pursuing who he is. He's teaching us about investment. Building your life around the right things. Putting your faith in the right things. So when he says, though the rain comes in verse 25, and it torrents, and the floodwaters rise, and the winds beat against the house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. It doesn't matter what comes because it's built on the right foundation. You've, you've established where your life is from the beginning. I, I'm, I'm grateful for this building because I always tell my family, if a tornado is ever coming, we only live a couple miles away. We will get in the car and we will come here and hide because this thing is an army tank. <laughs> this building is not going anywhere. It is immovable. It is, you go down to my office, it is like a block of concrete everywhere. I'm like, we're hiding out. I tell the boys all the time, do not stay in that house. If a tornado comes, you will die. <laughs> like, just come over. You know where the key is to my office. You can get in. I'm like, you got to get out of there. That, that is not a firm foundation next door. <laughs> but when you build your life on the firm foundation, when you're, when you're built on bedrock, the imagery that Jesus is getting here, this solid rock that he's talking about, what is your life built on? Jesus is literally telling us, you are going to get blasted by the trials of life if your life is not built on me first. And it sounds discouraging, but it's a warning to us. It's a warning of what our lives are built on and what our foundation is. Jesus is like, life is hard. Things are going to change. Things are going to come and go. Uh, but he's like, just have some kids and you'll see how fast your life will change. We'll see how, what your life is built on. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. He's like, things are going to come and go. Things are going to rise up. There are going to be days that you're just being beat by the waves. There's going to be days where you're in the sun, but it doesn't matter what you're facing if your foundation is right. What you invest in matters. He's saying, build it on my words, build it on my teachings. And so here's my question. Does your life reflect that? Is Jesus your source when you wake up? Does your prayer life reflect that? And I don't mean going to God and just asking. 
I'm a talker, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a learned introvert, and I'm a natural extrovert. Church has made me a learned introvert, <laughs> but I'm a natural extrovert. So the idea of sitting in silence is almost torture. I get around people like Thomas and some of these guys, and they're like, we're just going to sit and listen to God. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> can I play a game while I listen on my phone? Can I do, can I do anything? <laughs> can I listen to a podcast? And I'll listen. But, but the idea of just listening and sitting in God's presence is difficult. And I would imagine for most of us, it's difficult. But if you want to build a foundation in his presence, you have to learn to listen. You have to learn to sit and allow the Holy Spirit to speak, to begin to draw things out that maybe you're burying or you don't realize, and, and just receive what he has for you. There's a practice to it. There's a principle to it. This idea, I actually told John I wanted to end service today just sitting in silence. And I was like, people would be so uncomfortable. I would be uncomfortable. And I chickened out, to be honest. I was like, I can't, it's going to be weird. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to get hate mail or something. <laughs> but like, if, if we're talking about investments, why, why don't we approach God's presence the same way where we, we just sit ready to receive, asking him, making an investment of our time or making an investment of our energy into hearing from him the way Jesus talks. Receiving what he has for us. See, what I've found in my life is every time that my life gets out of whack or I'm burnt out or I'm, I'm in chaos or I'm, I'm filled with stress or I can't manage my stress or I'm anxious or I have anxiety or depression creeps in, all of these things that seem to plague us, it's usually because my foundation is not at the right source. I'm not sitting in his peace. It's what I talked about last week, this, this idea that, that Jesus is the source of our hope, peace, our love. It's usually because I'm not investing in the right things. My foundation is out of whack. Here's the, the, the principle I want you to catch this morning. Is that a firm foundation tends to be built slower. And it's not always fun but it's not easily moved. I want you to catch that because this is, if you don't take away anything and, and this idea of what's your life built on, becoming the immovable church, and even our community, let's talk big, like, like this church has been built slow. It has not been fun all the time. Newsflash. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you. But Doing the right things, pursuing the right things makes us immovable. I'm not interested in building a fast church, a flashy church, a church that just has fast growth. Because here's the thing about church communities. If a church is growing super fast, typically that means you're getting a lot of church people from other churches. That's not who God called us to be. I'm grateful if God leads you here, that's great. I'm not, I'm not shaming that. But, but I want to be the church that meets broken people in their lives, that, that people come and they're met with Jesus in the midst of their brokenness and they find healing and restoration and growth and they begin to pursue the call that God has for them. That's why I preached about our mission last week. Because that's who God has called us to be. And, and there is a pressure as a pastor. I look at churches that just, they pop up and a thousand people show up. And they're like killing it. And I celebrate them and I pray for them and I'm happy for them. I have friends that have churches like that. So I'm not, I'm not bashing it. But that hasn't been our story. And I had to come to the realization that that's not who God called us to be. That wasn't. I was not given that amount of grace to lead in that way. I've been given the grace to lead exactly what we have. And the same translates to your own life, is that building a firm foundation a lot of times is slow, and it doesn't look great all the time. But walking through the process is what gives you the longevity. I watched this project that's happening in front of our building. You, I'm pretty sure none of you missed it this morning as you drove in. <laughs> 
And I've been out there all the time. I come out a couple times a week, and I've actually built great relationships with some of the foremen, those guys that usually people yell at and hate. Like, I'm out there talking to them, asking them if they need anything. Like, we have an awesome relationship. Everyone else hates them, but I'm like, we're going to love you. People cut the fiber lines, and they were getting yelled at one day, and I was like, do you guys need anything? <laughs> I won't tell you what they asked for. <laughs> they were like, but... But we have a great relationship, but I watched this project taking place, and, and I'm, a, I'm a quick results guy. I want to see things go up fast. That's why I hate painting, because you have to do multiple layers, and it just seems obnoxious. Like, let's just do one, one and done. But for weeks, they've been moving dirt from one place to another, piles from one place to another. They literally, they knocked down the bridge, which was the fun part, in like one day, and then they've just been taking piles of gravel. And I'm like, this looks horrible. Even if you're in a big truck and it's fun, like you're literally just shuffling dirt around. And it seems like they're just moving it back and forth. But what they're doing is they're establishing the foundation for what they're going to build. And it takes weeks and times and they have, to, they have to put the right footers in and they have to make sure that the plumbing's right because if they don't get the water flow right, then things are going to wash away and erode and, and you'll have bigger problems down the road. They're building the foundation for the bridge that's coming later. And I was looking at it and I was thinking about our lives and how often we just want the quick result, but that's not how a firm foundation is built Jesus says in verse 26, anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey, anyone who doesn't build a firm foundation, anyone who, who is looking for fast results, anyone who's looking for just a band-aid or, or is just trying to sweep their problems under the rug, I don't, I don't know anyone who does that, myself included. Anyone who's just trying to get through fast, Anyone who is foolish and doesn't obey is like a person who builds their house on sand. When it rains and the floods come and the wind beats against the house, it will collapse like a mighty, mighty crash. Fast is easy, but slow builds security. Slow builds longevity. Slow builds a future. And, and here's what I want you to catch, church. I don't care how young you are or how old you are in the room. My prayer and my hope for you is that you would be building the things of Jesus within you for generational impact. I want my faith to be generational. I want to build a trust and a faith in Christ that my children see and they know this is how you build a foundation. This is how you put your faith in Jesus so that one day their children will see and one day their children... This is how you build generational lines for this church. I want to build a generational church. This church has been here since 1938, since like the dawn of time. It feels like if you saw it when we moved in, you would have thought so. It was like a tomb. <laughs> but I'm not looking to build a church that, that runs a nice 15 year, five years. The, the average church plant lasts three years. We've already beat that one. Praise God. Almost in it, but we did it. I don't want to build just a flashy, fast church. I want a generational church. That even beyond me, if, if I'm no longer here, that there is generational growth and people believe in this community and our foundation isn't in me or John or Lauren or any person, but our foundation is in Jesus. So even if you take the people out, we're built on an immovable foundation. We're built on his presence. It's my hope, it's my prayer, it's what I pray for our church all the time. That we, that we would build something that has generational impact. That's why we give to the things we do, that's why we operate the way we do, that's why we invest most of our money goes into our children's program. We spent more money on the basement of this place than on any other part of this whole building. 
Because I want to have a generational impact. But it starts with Christ. It starts with sitting in his presence. It starts with, with trusting him in the midst of joy and in the midst of chaos. What is your life built on? So here's my question as we wrap up. Here's my question that I was going to make you sit in silence for. But instead we brought John up to sing so it's a little more comfortable. But this is what I literally want you to ponder this morning. And if you want to sing, you can. But if you want to sit and just receive, um, I invite you to do that. Even if you think like my foundation is good, uh, that sometimes you need to check the foundation. You need to give it a look over. You need to check everything out. You need to revisit it. Here's my, here's my question. What in your life have you filled in the place of Christ? Where, where have you tried to supplement his presence with other things? Maybe you're feeling burnt out this morning. Maybe you're feeling tired. Maybe you're worn down. Maybe you're not joyful. Maybe, maybe you're, you feel emptied out. What have you been filling in the place of the presence of Jesus this morning? Where do you need to invite him to re-secure your foundation? And then my second prayer, the second thing I want you to think about is, is what in your life needs to change as a normal rhythm to pursue his presence daily? Because it's not like a one and done. You don't just get saved and then, nope, he's my foundation, we're good. No, life is going to trickle in, I promise you. You need rhythms. You need daily rhythms, monthly rhythms, yearly rhythms. And I'm not preaching as an expert on this because I fail at it way more than I went at it. But let's make a conscious effort to pursue him, to invite him into our lives, to build our life on what is immovable. Not just what is quick. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, we praise you. God, you are holy. You are mighty. God, I thank you that your son is the source that we need. That in your great love and wisdom you sent Jesus to save us and redeem us, but also to teach us what it means to build our lives around a secure source, to have an immovable life and immovable faith. God, I pray over our community. God, I pray that we would not be a church that flows with the wind, but God, that is has a firm foundation in who you are. And when we get misaligned, when things creep in, God, I pray that we would have rhythms that would draw us back to your presence so that we could receive the goodness and the fullness, the wholeness of who you are. God, that our lives could be, could be built around your presence, your goodness, that our faith would be placed in your Son so that we could have generational impact, so that we could reach more people for the gospel, that our impact could go not just within ourselves, but could travel further to bring more people into the good news of the gospel. So God, as we reflect, as we inward look this morning, as we receive, as we listen to the Holy Spirit move through this place, God, I pray that we would do some shuffling in our souls this morning. God, that we would make margin, priorities. We would put our flag in the right things and say, this is what truly matters. And it's 
presence, Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Because Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been